Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are, we are just blessed that we have this time to get together in God's Word. And this opportunity. And this opportunity to share in God's yes, Word. thank you, Lord. Um, I, I, before we start, I'm going to ask Mark to pray and ask God's blessing on our time. Because our time is going to get better, more blessed, and more challenging as we go on. Amen. Oh Lord, we just thank you for your word and the opportunity to get in it and see what it says. And Lord, this is, we're coming to the days that are kind of close to the end. And it says to look up for your, for your redemption draws near. And Lord, let us focus more on you and less of the world. Amen. 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 Well, let me, let me preface this by saying that last, our last program was a kind of a special program mm -hmm. that addressed what took place in Las Vegas just recently. With the with the slaughter of so many people that there were like twenty nine people no fifty nine fifty nine right fifty nine people fifty nine uh, people and five hundred and twenty seven injured injured yes and uh, unlike most of what I heard on the internet especially and I don't think it's coincidental that we've been in the in the book of the prophet Amos and I said when we started this many many weeks ago that this is a prophetic message of the end days of the kingdom of Israel. And I said, it is also God speaking an end days message to the kingdom of the world Amen. In, our, yes. in our times. Um, the message that I brought was not a pleasant message, but it came straight out of Amos. Yes, it did. Okay. And, you know, sometimes the word of God, sometimes a lot of times, mm. the word of God is difficult. Yes. It's hard. Yes. That's Die why, to yourself. That's why deny many, yourself. Yeah, that's why many of his followers, disciples, Left him. The great Deserted. apostasy. That's exactly what that's exactly right. In John chapter six. And look at verse six 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 or ver, chapter six, verse sixty six. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that many of his disciples left him because his word was too difficult. Mm -hmm. So when it gets like that, well what they did was they walked away. Yes. They didn't want to hear it. They chose not to be able to hear it. Right. All right? You have to accept the fact that Jesus is Lord and his word is life. Whether you like it or whether it tickles your flesh or not, and more, more often than not, it's it not, yeah. because it wants to kill your flesh. Yeah. You know, I, I said, this is a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. And the flesh and the spirit are constantly in conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. And it's a battle to the death. Yes. One of them has to die in order for the other to live. The life, of your, the life of your flesh inhibits the life of your spirit. And when you are living in the spirit, your flesh means nothing. That's right. Okay? So it, it's very, very possible that a lot of people will have, will have heard that message and then refuse to have hear, heard it because it's a difficult message. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Which brings us to where we are now in Amos. In chapter 8, I want to read verses 11 and 12. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine or for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north and even to the east. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Now remember, this is a famine for hearing the word. Yes. Okay. There'll be plenty of word there. Um, well, it's not about the Lord stopping his no. word from going forth, okay? Although there will come a time when there is silence, silence in, in heaven, heaven, all right? That's right. But it's, it's rather about the world no longer listening, mm -hmm. okay? You know, I've, I've referred to a book that I have in progress for a long time that I've actually done some radio programs on called The Schemes of the Devil, and the triumph of Christ Jesus. And I talk about the three, what I see as the three major wild schemes that the devil uses to attack the people of God. Mm -hmm. 
And it's about division. He wants to divide us. If he can divide us from one another, he'll divide us from the Lord. It's about a distraction, about getting our eyes off of Jesus Christ. That's a biggie. And uh, probably the single biggest is he wants to disarm us. Yes. And the only weapon that we haven't given is the word of God, the sword of the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. You have to remember that the fall of man started when the serpent called God's word into question. Yes. That was the beginning of everything, right? Mm -hmm. In Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty, more subtle, mm -hmm. than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. It was then that that old devil said to a human for the first time, but not the last mm -hmm. by any means, that God's word is not true. Yes. Right? Because when she... calls it into question. He calls it, he calls the veracity of the word of God into question. Mm -hmm. And then when she responds, you know, God, you got, he says, well, surely you will not die. So what he is saying from the very, very beginning is God's word is a lie. That's right. That's right. God's word is not true. Now, do you think that he has stopped doing that? No. Not by any means. Okay. The attack on the people of God is still an attack on the word of God, right? Yes. He is saying that it's, it's not true. It doesn't mean what it says. It's not for this time. It's not relevant. It's it's usurped by tradition. Whatever he can say, he's trying to cancel out the word of God in our lives, all right? One of the problems is people stop hearing the word simply because they don't like it. And that's a good enough reason in this age of me, of this me generation, right? Doesn't tickle their ear. Which is why I said, if you don't like the message that I that I brought last week, is it because it's not true? Is it because it's not the word of God? Is it or is it just because it's too hard? It's too hard and you don't like what it's saying. Mm. Satan's goal is to attack our righteousness. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Our right? relationship with the Lord. Because that's what our righteousness is is our relationship with the Lord. And if he can separate us from God, he's killed us. He comes to kill. Well, sep yeah. separation from God is death. Well, think about this, what the word says about the word, right? Mm -hmm. In Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Psalm 119, 9, right? And then Timothy wrote, Paul wrote, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, three sixteen. All scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Well, if you're apart from the word, you're not going to get trained in righteousness. Even if you have received that free gift of God, eternal life, which is accompanied because of the right relationship with the father. Mm -hmm. If you're not trained in it, you'll not walk in it. Right. And if you don't walk in it, you're going to walk away from it. Okay. A famine for the hearing of the word. You got that, right? But I want to take just a little bit of a side trip here. And it's ever so important. It's important to me, and I pray it's important to you. I want to talk about the voice of the Lord. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to read a couple of scriptures to, to set a context for this. In Psalm 29, starting at verse 3, it says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes a deer to calf and strips the forest bears. And in his temple, everything says glory. And then in John chapter 10, where, you know, where Jesus said that he comes to bring life, starting in the first verse, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, what was that again, John? Uh, John ten, chapter 10, starting in the verse first, right? Here's the point I want to make. In Scripture, in a sense, there's a difference between the Word and God's voice. Mm-hmm. All right? And I'm going to show you that in, in the Scriptures, there's a difference between the Word and the Word, which I'll talk about. Okay. But I want to start, and I have to do this. I need to share something about my salvation. I, I, I've probably shared this testimony a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to go into it in great detail. But the fact of the matter is, before I was saved, now God, now I know, in retrospect, I know that God had his hand on my life from while I was yet in my mother's womb. I mean, that's very obvious from my testimony. Mm-hmm. But I, I was, before I got saved, I was, a, I was an egomaniac. Mm-hmm. I was so filled with pride. I was one of the first yuppies, I think, you know. I had a great job as a consultant in New York City. We had a home in the suburbs. Uh, um, you know, I had sports cars, luxury cars. I just, I had all this stuff. I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't, I wasn't, there was, there was a great lack in my heart. And this manifested itself by when I would go out at night and I would look up at the sky, I would look at the stars, I'd look at the moon, I'd look at the stars. And I would feel crushed. Mm -hmm. I would feel so insignificant that I felt like absolutely nothing. And it pained me. I could look at other people and I judged myself against them. Well, I earned more money. I had more stuff. And I felt great. But when I looked up at the stars. You get depressed. I I would literally get depressed. Mm -hmm. To the point where Alice said to me, don't don't go out at night and start stand there and look at this stuff. And then Alice had gotten saved the month before me. And she brought... We were both raised Catholic. I went to to all through Catholic schools. I had never read the Bible. I mean, you know, I may have heard a scripture here and there. You go to to Mass and you may hear a scripture and a scripture, not preaching from the word necessarily. But she brought home a Bible. I had never read a Bible. This was on my 33rd birthday, 41, just over 41 years ago. And I was sitting one day. She'd gone out on my birthday to get me a birthday cake. And I was sitting at my kitchen table having a cup of coffee, and I looked up on the refrigerator, and there was a Bible she brought into the house. And I don't know why, but I walked over, and I picked up that Bible, I came, and I sat back down, and I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to know. And I just randomly flipped open the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I looked down, and I saw these words. Pray for me today. Okay. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. What verse out of all of the thousands of verses in the Bible could God have led me to that showed? And then I read the word, and it it, it just, I don't know how it grabbed my heart. But then... I heard a voice, and that voice said to me, not only am I real, but I know exactly what is in your heart. I read the word, then I heard the voice. You know, even in scripture, there are two Greek words that are used for for word, logos Mm -hmm. and rhema. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rhema is a, a more difficult word to translate because it literally means a spoken word. Okay, Mm -hmm. so I I think, you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of teaching on it, not all necessarily accurate in in the Pentecostal and charismatic movement about the rhema word. But it's a different thing when you hear God, you read God's word and you can be hearing the word. But there's a different thing when you hear the voice of God speak to you. It changes everything. Right. It was only when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus. And cried out with a loud voice. 
Lazarus, that he came to life. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? That's right. Okay. Satan wants to destroy that. You need to be reading the word, so you're he but, but you need to be hearing it. Mm -hmm. And then, by the power of the Spirit of God within you, you should be hearing his voice, because you're supposed to know his voice. What that does is it transforms it inside of you. Mm -hmm. It makes it come, it makes it come alive. Yes. God's word is profitable for, for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness. But something else happens when you hear the voice of God. Now, the question, have you ever heard the voice of God? If you have not heard God speak to you, whether it's a thunder on the mountain or a still small voice like with Elijah, Elijah, pray and seek God that that word would be quickened to you, that you would hear Jesus speaking that word to you, because these are the days when we need to have that word, right? The word of God has always been under attack. I said, that's how it started in the garden. So from the beginning of man's history, Satan has been attacking the word. That said, I think in the last 40 years, 40 some odd years, the word has come under attack like never before. Yes. It started back in the beginning of the 1900s. And it started then because there was a movement. It coincided with a movement to create a Jewish state. Mm. And then it, it goes, when Israel became a state, things really, really began to change. Mm. The word of God, is, in the beginning of the 1900s, there was a new theology of redaction criticism and, and criticism, literary criticism of the Bible that kept calling the, the word of God into question like never before, all right? I mean, prior to that, you may not believe it, you may not like it, but, you, you know, it was the word of God. Mm -hmm. Now it's being twisted, it's being bent, it's being, it's, I, you know, I mentioned to Alice just the other day, I was reading in the news about a book, a new, a, a relatively new book, it's called The Bible for Grown-Ups. It was published in August of 2016. Uh, and here's a Publishers Weekly review from of that book. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is about the Bible for grown-ups. When you know, hey, let's this is you know, be real about it. It was written by Simon Loveday. So the review says Loveday's declarations underscore his research. He writes. The only authority in the Old Testament is what we give it. And the writers of the Synoptic Gospels were wrong. And if they were wrong, so was Jesus. You know, there's there are books out, like, I think, what are they called? Something for Idiots? Oh, this yeah. isn't the Bible. For, this, this book is not about the Bible for, for grown-ups. This is a book about the book for idiots. Yeah. A recent survey, a very, very recent survey, I mean, just a, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, that was, that was commissioned by the Church of England, where we spent a lot of time, mm. said most people who call themselves Church of England Christians never read the Bible. And then in it, it says only 6% of those polled read the Bible. Read the Bible. 94% of these people who call themselves Christians never read the Bible. If they don't read it, I promise you, they don't know it. And if they don't know it, they don't know Jesus. And if they don't know the word, they're going to be deceived so easily, right? And then, as I was praying, I came across, just a couple of days ago, a couple of days ago, yeah, just a couple of days ago, from a Ro Roman Catholic organization, right? They, they, well, I'm not going to go into it, but I'm going to give you a quote from it. Talking about, this is what they said, it's a theological train wreck is the Protestant dogma of sola scriptura. Mm -hmm. Sola scriptura was what started the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther saying it's all about scripture. Scripture alone determines, right? Now, he quotes the Vatican Council. He quotes a, a letter from Pope Paul. This, 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 I guess that would have been the sixth or fourth. Well, Pope Paul. Oh, those are all your popes. Yeah, in, in 1965. It was Pope Paul VI. Yeah, that's what I thought. 
It's not from sacred scripture alone that the church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. Therefore, sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. They're different. They're different sources, and they tell us somewhat different things. Now, I will tell you that I did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. It's not like they once in a while conflict Catholic tradition and the Word of God. It's a constant battle. And just think about what it said. This is the Pope. Sacred scripture and sacred tradition form one. Do you notice it's the tradition takes uh, the tradition takes the first place and the scripture takes the second place? Mm-hmm. Because in their theology, scripture will always give way to their tradition. Oh, yes, give way, yeah. Yes, give way, eh? Their tradition always wins out. Right, yeah. Uh, Do you know that prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, when in the fullness of time he was born and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Mm -hmm. there were 400 years, roughly, of silence, scripturally. There were no prophets, for 400 years, mm. from Malachi up until the birth of John the Baptist, or the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. And, and um, Gabriel came and announced. He brought word from God to Zacharias, John's father, who was officiating in the temple, mm-hmm. and said, you're going to have a son, and you call his name John. And Zacharias said, ha, 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 ha. So this is only the word of God. I mean, Gabriel's bringing a message. What did he say? He said, your mouth will be shut until your child is born and you name him John. The word of God is a serious thing, not to be not to be taken lightly, all right? John the Baptist said that his joy was made full because he heard the voice of the bridegroom, Jesus, right? It says that in John 3, 29. And then he heard, therefore he spoke, which is what we're supposed to do, right? Faith comes by hearing. It says, by, with the heart man believes, with the mouth he confesses. If you don't know the word, and you don't know, then you don't know Jesus, who is the word. People can know a number of scripture verses and still not know the word. The Pharisees are the great example of that. The Pharisees were, I mean, these are the quote unquote, they're the Bible conservatives of the day, scripture conservatives, although in fact they were led more often by script by tradition mm-hmm. than right. by the word of God, which is what Jesus had to say to them. He said, you know, talking to them about being hypocrites, and he said, you know, how nicely you set aside the commandment of God, the word of God, to hold fast to your traditions. So even that, I mean, there's nothing says there's nothing new under the sun. I mean Satan is not creative. He has no creative power, and he hasn't come up with any new ideas, right? But the Pharisees, who literally, and this is true, literally, could quote some scriptures backwards and forwards. I mean, they knew scriptures, all right? Mm -hmm. And yet, they did not recognize the word of God when he walked through their midst. They didn't recognize the voice of of God when Jesus spoke. I know this is a favorite verse in Mark, Psalm 119, verse 165. It says that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. We live in a world that is so easily offended. I mean, it is incredible. You know why? Because they don't love the world. The word. The word. They do love the world. That's yeah. the problem. Why do you think, I mean, I, I don't know what it's like where you are, but I know here we are in Central Florida. All you see in billboards and news ads and, and the, the television spots, lawyers. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, sue some, basically, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, sue somebody today. Right. They, they depend on that, that contention yes. by taking offense, right? If you get offended... And I know I've shared this before. I had a woman in London come up to me one time and said that she had just been to a seminar on and one of the topics they covered was, you know, when people offend you. Oh, my goodness. How do you deal with that when people offend you? 
So she came to me and she said, what do you do when people offend you? Well, what should I do when people offend me? That's what she said. I said, well, repent. And she said, what do you oh, mean? No, you don't understand. You don't understand. They offended me. I, yeah, I, that's what she said to me. She said, I, they offended me. I said, yeah, I know that. I said, repent. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, because when if you take offense, it is a clear sign. It's a warning button on your dashboard that says you don't love God's word just as much or quite as much as you thought you did. Mm -hmm. Okay? We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to know it, but you and you have to know the whole thing. Is that not true? Yes. Satan is a master liar. He's a, I, I, I promise you, he's had more practice at lying than you've had at discerning the truth. Okay? It says in the Bible, there is no God. Yes, it does. Well, now you want to know something. It says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. Mm -hmm. It says twice in the Bible that I can think of that there is no God. Twice in Psalms. Twice in Psalms. Oh, actually, you look at the whole thing. If you if you rightly divide it, it says only the fool says in his heart there is no God. But if you take it out of context and you pick it and you mishandle the Word of God, if you wrongly divide it, you can make it say whatever you want, which is what a lot of people are doing, unfortunately. So. We're living in the last days. I, I believe that. And so it gets worse. You know, everything that's happened, there's nothing new under the sun, as I say. All of the things that are forecast for the end days, it's it's really a matter of degree, I think, for most of them, just increasing. There have always been wars and rumors of wars. Yes. There's always been famines. There's always been earthquakes. But there's going to be this drastic, drastic increase in them. People are going to be misled. That was a, one of the first things when the apostles came to Jesus and said, tell us what the signs will be. One of the first things he says is that there's going to be false prophets, false teachers, and it will mislead many. You have to abide in the word. You have to know the word. You have to be in the word. Otherwise, you will be deceived. You will be led astray. You know why? Because you won't know his voice. Mm -hmm. And when you study the word, you need to be studying the word and praying that you will hear the voice of God speak it to you. Paul wrote to Timothy. Again, I want to go. This is the fourth chapter of that second letter. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth. Only the voice of God and the Holy Spirit within you who is sent to lead you into all truth. It's going to protect you, and you will be unprotected if you don't abide in the Word. That's right. This is not a joke. It's serious stuff. It is life and death. You need to spend time in the Word. You need to hear the voice of God. Dig out your ears. Pray that. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Lord, that you're, you, you just thunder from Zion, Lord God. That wisdom stands in the street and shouts. Lord, I pray that we would that we would hear your word, Lord, that it wouldn't be dull or dead to us. And then we would hear your voice that would change us completely in Jesus' name. God bless you. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my true.